Our next paper bears the title, Populism and the Republic, How Populism is Destroying American Democracy. Please welcome Trevor Beecham. Summer, 1918. The clock struck 12 when Alexandra and Nicholas were awoken by the terrified physician. They were to march down with their children to the cellar. Surrounded by guards, the family was sealed in the cold basement. Once inside, Alexandra didn't even have time to cross herself before the guards opened fire on the family. The parents were killed instantly. The daughters, saved by the crystals in their nightgowns that absorbed the impact of the rounds, survived only long enough to be murdered by a bayonet or shot point blank in the head. Their remains would be buried in an unmarked grave, almost forgotten. This is the story of the Romanov family's fate. For centuries, they ruled Russia until the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, a populist movement that rocked the globe. But what is populism? Well, properly understood, it is a way of manipulating the political process by alienating an elite minority and appealing to the will of the majority. These elite minority groups can have distinguishing characteristics relating to class and wealth or ethnic and cultural identity, shifting when discussing the left or the right. Even more noteworthy, with the Great Recession of 2008 and the looming economic crisis brought on by the coronavirus, the political monster has again reared its ugly head in the United States. Although it can seem to be an effective vehicle for political change, populism is in fact ineffective and destructive to the American Republic due to it being inconsistent and inexpedient within a stable democracy. Why? American political theory is based on the free exchange of ideas, whereas populism panders to differences in class and culture. Therefore, populism directly threatens the free, exchange of, the free exchange of ideas, the lifeblood of American republicanism. One way in which we see this is where New Deal Democrat George Wallace courted voters leading up to and during the civil rights movement of the 1960s by painting a picture of a federal government that was oppressing the rights of the individual when discussing racial integration in the Jim Crow South. In embracing such a strategy, Wallace was able to successfully build a coalition of voters against this political establishment. But at what cost? Racial tensions worsened, leading to violent resurgences from the Ku Klux Klan and the Black Power Movement. Socioeconomically, the South was divided from the rest of the nation for at least a decade to come illustrating just how populism might seem effective in the short term, but is ultimately ineffective in the long term. Unfortunately, not one, but both major parties in the United States are guilty of invoking these temporary societal grievances in order to further their political agenda. Unlike the Southern Democrats, who sought to prevent integration by populist means, Cold War era Republicans uh, such as Senator Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin, pandered to populations otherwise neglected by American society up until that point in order to gain support for his anti-communist investigations. McCarthy's newfound followers demanded the raiding of homes of suspected communists and radicals, showing how populist-fueled anger towards a perceived elite in society can infringe on our rights as everyday Americans. Even firefighters, teachers, and janitors working for the state in any capacity were compelled to swear loyalty before setting off to work. With valid concerns over who is in power in the American government being a very legitimate concern as to whether or not we utilize these populist platforms, some might argue that these strategies are politically expedient. 
A supporter of this perspective might argue that the elites in power do, in fact, need to be put through the ringer. So why not use these platforms to push for an agenda so desperately needed by the working class? Admittedly, there are portions of this argument that hold weight. Americans should be aware of who they're voting into office and should be wary of corruption. However, in the words of the late Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, efficiency and promptness can never be substituted for due process and adherence to the Constitution, meaning that we should never sacrifice our principles for the sake of political expediency. From this, Americans should be assured that there are other, more beneficial, less divisive ways to bring meaningful change in our government. This brings us to June 16th, 2015. Nearly a century has passed since the Romanov tragedy. On this day, Donald Trump announces his candidacy for president. In the months prior, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders did the same. Together, these three figures would shift American politics towards populism for years to come. The Republican Party, under Trump's leadership, would make inroads to the working class voters of the Rust Belt by embracing a populist nationalist message, while the Democratic Party under Clinton and Sanders would make inroads to the young and the financially struggling by embracing a populist socialist message. In the present, these campaigns don't seem too extreme. They don't fail as Wallace and McCarthy once did. But should we be fearful of the future by remembering the past? Was revolution where the Bolsheviks started? No. In the beginning, they used populism to paint themselves as an anti-war party, fighting against a dismissive government for an oppressed people. In the end, a political machine was embraced. Promises were broken. Children were murdered. And an even more oppressive state rose from the ashes. As we move ahead in American political cycles, we must never forget that this is the twisted populist path.